It's time for Inside the Jets, presented by EY, building a better working world. Now, here's Bart Scott and Dan Grossa. And what is going on, everybody? Welcome to another edition of Inside the Jets, presented by EY, building a better working world. Dan Grassa, joined as always by my friend Bart Scott. Bart, how's everything going, my friend? Akuda Matata. Things could be better, but they definitely could be worse as well. So I'm right there in the middle, baby, where you like to be. Absolutely. Balance. That's the important thing every day. You want that balance. You want that consistency. And unfortunately for the Jets yesterday, they didn't have enough of that and that's why they came on the short end of a 25-6 to setback to the New England Patriots at MetLife Stadium. It was a great atmosphere, home opener. Fans were eager to get back to support the green and white, but unfortunately, one too many miscues, especially on the offensive side of the ball, Bart, where Zach Wilson, four interceptions coming on his first 10 passes of the game. Robert Sala said it afterwards, you know, when you lose the turnover battle, it's going to be tough to beat almost anybody. When you dig yourself that deep of a hole, it's almost pretty much impossible. Yeah, when you talk about sometimes winning boring is the way to go. And, you know, you understand the pressure, right? You know, People have, we haven't had, it was the first time in a year and a half that we've had fans inside of the stadium as electric. And I just think the young kid came in, he wanted to, he wanted, he was too eager to please. He was too eager to show off the big arm and he took some throw, he made some throws that you really can't make in his league. You can get away with them once or twice, but you know, you can't make a living in throwing through traffic or trying to fit it into tight spots. Sometimes you just have to give you know, you have to take what the defense is given, and he was trying too hard and pressing a little bit. And it's something that the young kid will learn from. You know, understand that when you have the football in your hands, you have everybody's future in your hands because you are the most important person there because you touch the football every single play. Every play starts and ends with you. And I think this is a learning experience for him. And I think he's going to get coached up today once they talk, go over the film. And he's going to understand that all you have to do is put the ball in your playmaker's hands. And it's not all about you. You don't have to put it all on you. Because if you looked across the other sideline, that's exactly what Mac Jones did. Mac Jones didn't light it up. He didn't make any big time throws, any wild, wowing, you know, 90, you know, 90 yard bombs thrown across his body. All he did was facilitate. And that's really what the role of the quarterback is, is to put the ball in the playmaker's hands and let them shine. I think you hit it right on the head. You know, good contrast. You saw the other rookie quarterback, Mac Jones, do the same thing. Didn't really wow you with a lot of the throws, but played safe, played very controlled football, and it was effective enough for the New England Patriots yesterday. The one thing that jumps out to me, though, the first two weeks of the season here for the New York Jets, and certainly this is something that they're going to be harping on, too, as they get ready for their next opponent, which will be the Denver Broncos in week three. Offensively, Bart, the first half of these two games so far, they haven't really been able to put enough consistent drives together right. And points on the scoreboard. They have three points so far in the opening half of the first two ball games. Well, I tell you what, it's all about getting out to a fast start and creating some momentum. I don't know if they have to kind of go back and figure out what their first 15 plays are. Because most of the first the first drives, the first 15 plays are scripted. And you kind of go and you throw everything that you're going to throw at the team from a formation-wise. You're gathering all the information that you need to see how they react into certain formations, shifts and motions. And um, that's what it's all about. So it's imperative that you get off to a fast start because in this league, you can't really try and fight and dig yourself out of a hole. They're going to have to figure out what their recipe is. But I tell you what, one thing I was impressed with, their ability to run the ball and their commitment to running the ball. Now, it's, it's two schools of thoughts when you think about that, right? You got to ask yourself, well, maybe New England was playing light in the box so that they can allow, you know, Zach Wilson to have to throw through complex coverages. Or you can say, hey, well, the offensive line has kind of really tightened up you know, because they struggled. That was a unit that struggled the first week. You know, they didn't see a lot of free runners, and you saw them able to push guys off the ball and run the ball against the New England Patriots. That's going to be a recipe for success because that's going to be the most important thing is running the ball and allowing, you know, the offense to dictate and manipulate the safeties and linebackers because that's the space that you want to really want to live, you know, in between and be able to get, you know, high percentage throws. Absolutely. I think you hit it right on the head, right? Because in week one down in Carolina, Jets really didn't have a lot of real estate to be able to run the football. Big difference. Complete 180 against the Pats there on Sunday. 152 yards, almost five yards of carry. Bart, you run the ball that effectively. More often than not, you're going to do good things offensively. And the way this West Coast offense is predicated 
the running game is what really sets up the passing game. So you would think that on most Sundays, if the Jets are going to run the ball effectively as they did yesterday, that's usually going to mean some good things for the offense and in turn, Zach Wilson in that passing attack. Yeah, because you can't, like I say all the time, you can't have action without, you know, play action. You can't play action without action. And that action is running the ball and making people fearful of you winning on first down. Winning on first down puts them in a dilemma, puts defenses in a dilemma, trying to figure out, you know, what's second down. And second down is a tremendous play action down because it can be either a run or a pass to try and, you know, get the sticks. If if you're running the ball at a five-yard clip, that means technically if you continue that, you know, that you're going to be getting the first down every two plays, you know, then they have to put the eighth man in the box, and that's when you're able to get those explosive plays and show off that beautiful arm. You know, but listen, this is something they're going to have to learn from. I think on the flip side, the defense did a tremendous job in being put in some very adverse situations to go down in the half after having that many turnovers and only be down, you know, you know, 10 to thir- uh, 13 to 3, down 10 points was a blessing. I thought they fought hard, and I thought, you know, what we thought was going to be a big issue going into this year, the fact that they let guys like Bless on Austin go, they didn't bring in and go draft or go in free agency to get a lot of – high-end corners, let you know that the system is working, that they're teaching these guys, you know, formational uh, awareness, understanding, not getting beat. And it's not like they're just coming out there and play Tampa 3 or Tampa 2 or 3. They're still out there competing, playing cover one, but everybody's playing at a high level, and that's something that you can build off of. So when you go watch this film today, it's about building off the positives and eliminating the negatives. Uh, You're absolutely right about that. You know, defensively, you think about New England and what they did. 16 of the 25 points they scored came off of those jet turnovers there. So as a whole, that side of the football, talking about Jeff Ulbrich's defense, they really buckled down and did a nice job there. Remember, the talk all throughout the week that Robert Sala and Jeff Ulbrich were telling everyone was, you know, their philosophy is to eliminate the explosive plays. And for the most part, they did that yesterday. You know, Harris had the one big run there for the touchdown, which, you know, there were some missed tackles along the way. But I thought as a whole, this defense played very, very well. I mean, they kept the Patriots to only 260 yards of total offense, Bart. I think when you look at the eight quarters as a whole this year from the defensive side of things, I think there's a lot to be satisfied with, especially considering, as you said, think of how many youngsters, rookies, second-year players that they're trying to incorporate onto that side of the ball. Well, that's why you have to play complementary football. That's why it's important for Zach Wilson to understand that, hey, listen, a punt is a good thing. Because if you punt the football, you can maybe play the field position game and you can gain yardage that way and let their young quarterback or let their quarterback make the mistake because our defense is capable of that, right? They're capable of getting to the passer. I think emerging early on in this season, we thought, you know, how would the Jets replace Carl Lawson? Well, Franklin Myers is starting to assert himself and, and get recognition for what he's been able to do and how he's playing early on in the season. We saw Sheldon Rankins come around and we know if he can get back to that pro bowl form Quentin Williams is working his way back into shape to get ready to continue to be able to you know start taking the next step you know coming off of injuries trying to get back his his sea legs I believe underneath him and and CJ Mosley has been who he's always been when he's healthy that's one of the top five middle linebackers in this game Marcus May showed up so you know once you understand that on the other side like listen we're a team we're not offense defense we're a unit and sometimes you got to say you know what i don't want to put my brothers in harm's way so i'm going to make sure that i make the right play and that may be throwing the ball away that may be eating it i think early on if if i can have one critique of zach wilson is that he doesn't understand in this league that windows open and close pretty fast and sometimes you can't hold on you can't take that millisecond to think about it it has to be impulsive you have, you have to be able to, to, to throw the ball when you see your guy open and let him work. You know, there was a couple of plays where, you know, he had, you know, they had sell routes, boots, and he's throwing it to the, to the tight end or throwing it to the receiver, and he's on the sideline where he has no choice but to go out of bounds. But understand that once you flip those shoulders, if you can get, get him the football in his hands, then you have an opportunity to get those yak yards. You got those opportunities to get explosives. You know, you, it goes down in the books the same. You know what I mean? It, it, it doesn't, you know, if you throw a, two-yard pass and a guy runs 25 yards, well, guess what? You get to add 27 yards to your passing total. It's, it's okay. It's not all the time about how far it goes in the air. And that's something that they have to learn how to play as a team, as a unit. Understand what you do on offense affects the defense. What you do on defense affects the offense. And special teams all are connected.
No, you're absolutely right about that. I mean, and the Jets have seen it up close from the other side of things, right? Last week in the game against Carolina, think of how many dump offs that Sam Darnold had to Christian McCaffrey, which went for a lot of yards. Yesterday, Mac Jones had a couple of them to James White, as a matter of fact. So, look, moving the football any which way you can is something I'm sure that those coaches are going to drill into Zach Wilson here moving forward. And look, there's a lot of quarterbacks that have games like he did yesterday. The real good ones end up becoming the ones who learn from those mistakes and are able to apply those tough lessons into positives moving forward. And Again, it'll be next test up for the Jets and Zach Wilson, that offense, coming up next Sunday in Denver against the Broncos. And this is Inside the Jets. We're brought to you by Selective Insurance. Be uniquely insured. Now, one of the guys that stood out yesterday, Bart, one of the rookies on this team, one of the many that have made a contribution here thus far, that's Michael Carter, the running back out of North Carolina, was the team's leading rusher yesterday in the game against the New England Patriots. And after it went final, our team reporter Ethan Greenberg sat down with the Jet rookie. Here with running back Michael Carter. Michael, what didn't work for the offense today? I don't know. I guess we'll have to go back and look on the film. I think that it's important that we just we just strain to finish each play. Um, New England was a good team, and I think that we you know it's one of them teams that you gotta be on your p's and q's to beat. So I think just uh, moving forward, we just gotta go look at the film and see what we did wrong and, and did right, and build off of, build off what we did right and correct what we did wrong. Obviously, tough day at the offense for your rookie quarterback Zach Wilson. But did you say anything to him, and what did you notice about his temperament throughout the course of the game? I think I think I'm, I'm really proud of Zach. You know, and and a lot of people. I think Jets fans are so eager to win that it's that, you know they, they get upset easily. But I feel like you know with, with what we're doing right now, you know, and we love the, we love the fans so much, and we want we want to win way worse than they do. Like we want them to know that. So um, we're working every single day. I'm really proud of Zach because you know amidst all the boos and amidst all the everything, you know he kept playing and he made some great throws after that. He made some great decisions after that. So um, it's a we're working every day. Nobody's perfect, and we just we just want to be great. So we're working towards that. How comfortable do you feel in this offense? Feels like you had a very good performance. I know it's a team game. You averaged over five yards a carry, and felt like you had one of your better days today. Yeah, I feel like um, the, first of all, our offense line they blocked it up. Um, we did a great job. Just we came in with the right mindset today, and I feel like our mindset as a team is is right, and we're developing into a championship mindset every day and in a fight you know you're gonna get hit but as long as you hit back you know i feel like that's that's a sign of a sign of growth and so i feel like even though we lost today i feel like we grew as a team what do you guys need to do is there one thing in particular that comes to mind for next week against the broncos mm-hmm. as an um, offense in particular yeah i just feel like um it's always going to be about us so um of course they got a great defense um then they got one of the best in the league um and that just speaks to the you know to the time that they put in but I think as far as next week goes, like it's about us, you know, as it is every week. Like we got to focus on we on what we got to do because at the end of the day, we got to do what we got to do to make things happen. You know, nobody's gonna give anything to us in this league, as you can see. You know, it's hard enough to win um, when the when it's all even, but you know when we're making mistakes, and it gets way harder. So we just gotta play mistake-free football. Awesome, Michael. Thanks a lot. Appreciate the time. All right, thank you. Man. All right, thanks to Ethan Greenberg, and thanks to Michael Carter for chatting after that game yesterday. And Bart, you know, the success of the running game, and as things really got going for them yesterday, when you look at the different personnel packages that the Jets featured, one of them that really stood out, I thought you saw a little bit more of that traditional 12 personnel with the one running back and the two tight ends, you know, Ryan Griffin, Tyler Croft. Those guys also got in there and did a lot of the dirty work when it came to run blocking, helping to open up a lot of these holes, which these running backs ended up finding some success with. Well, you talk about that Tiger personnel, that personnel that people love to have. You talk about the Tampa Bay Buccaneers have it. You know, if they looked on the other sideline, they see it with um, John o. Smith and they see it with Hunter Henry. It, it creates so many different issues, especially if you have guys that are able to be able not just, you know, blockers, but also can catch the football down the field. And you think about the boots and waggles, that's usually what's used is in that personnel off the play action. You know, I think also, you know, being able to help the offensive line as well to give support when it is play action. Now you have tight ends on the outside. You have more of a seven-man protection, you know, that allows you to get to the end. And that's really what they have to do. Early on, that's what LaFleur is going to have to do is really figure out what his best personnel group is, you know, versus the opponent that they're going against. Yesterday was 12 personnel of what we call, where I'm from, Tiger personnel. 
you know, was able to be able to be successful and, and help you get to the edges because the misdirections, getting that more athletic, more athletic person to the second level to try and hit moving targets. There's a lot to ask sometimes to ask, you know, 340 pound men to go to the second level and hit a kid or a guy that's quicker than you, faster than you. Yes, you're bigger than, than him, but it's hard to hit a gnat, right? We've all tried to catch a fly. We all try to swat a gnat and most more times than not, we miss him. You know, so I think, you know, this, going forward, you know, let's see if they can generate this and this can become a habit, not just a one-off. Certainly something the offense wants to feature a heck of a lot more like this moving forward here throughout the course of the season. Well, we talked about Michael Carter, the running back. When we return here on Inside the Jets, we'll check in on the other Michael Carter. He, of course, the corner out of Duke. This is Inside the Jets presented by EY, building a better working world. And welcome back to Inside the Jets presented by EY, building a better working world. Dan Grasso alongside Bart Scott. It's now time for our player guest segment, also presented by EY, Building a Better Working World. And we're pleased to be joined by one of those rookies that is making plenty of contributions for this 2021 version of the New York Jets. He is the rookie corner from Duke, and he's Michael Carter. He's nice enough to give us some time here on the program. Michael, it's Dan Gross and Bart Scott. Thanks for spending some time with us today. How are you? I'm good. How are y'all? Maintaining, maintaining. Tell us what, first of all, for the first time in a year and a half, we had fans in MetLife Stadium. Tell us just coming out of the tunnel, you know, being able to open up what it felt like, one, to, to really be accomplished your dream, but two, to kind of hear the cheers for the first time of your home fans when they count and it's going on a permanent record. Yeah, I think, um, you know, it added more fuel to the fire for me, um, just coming out and, and being in that environment um, as packed as it was for the first time. Um, and just, you know, just continuing to, bring even more emotion than, than what I was feeling um, coming in um, and, and anxiousness as well to, to just go out there and hit somebody. Um, it felt really good to be out there, though. Was that as loud? I was going to say, Michael, was that as loud and as packed as any stadium that maybe you've ever played in before? I mean, compared to the college level? Yeah, 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 for sure. I mean, um, I think the only other stadium I can think of that um, – was loud, but definitely I don't even think as loud as that was um, like Virginia Tech or something like that. Now, I know like when you when you go in, like not only is this opening day at the home stadium, open it up, but also you're going against the divisional rival, the fold, the team that's had our numbers or had everybody number for the majority of the last 20 years. Um, how did that feel? And how was the week of focus and preparation? Was it any butterflies for you or were you just so locked into the game plan that you're ready, ready to go? Yeah, I mean, I think as as far as the game plan, um, you know, I was definitely locked in. I think, um, you know, along with what I was doing as far as film study and uh, our coaches, um, you know, they prepared us um, really good um, to as far as what we might expect from from them. And, and so going into it, you know, I feel like we had all the, the confidence in the world to be able to um, defend what was going on out there. Eight tackles for you yesterday, which was second on the team. One of them was for loss. You know, I, a lot of fans, they think about the corner position, and it's just running alongside a wide receiver, making sure that he doesn't get open to catch a pass from the QB there. But the tackling element is also a very, very big part of playing your position. How much of an emphasis do you put on that and the work that you do in getting yourself ready to play each and every work technique to make sure that, hey, if you got to wrap up, you're going to wrap up? Yeah, yeah. Um... I think what, you know, what helped me a lot was just being, even though, you know, in college, um, being a nickel corner and, and moving around, um, you know, playing all the positions at some point or one point or another, um, the way it was set up in at Duke was, you know, our nickels were in the safety room. So we learned how to say all the safety stuff. We did individual drills with the safeties. Um, and so I was considered a safety and, and that kind of, um, you know, develop my mentality as far as, you know, I'm a considered a nickel cornerback or whatever, but, um, you know, I have that safety uh, come downhill mindset. It's crazy because I, I played safety and linebacker in both college and in the league as well. And what it really does is it helps develop your eyes because a lot of guys that have to drop down into that box can't understand what the combination of blocking schemes are, whether the, the guard is pulling somebody's, you know, the, the end man on line scrimmage is, is blocking down. They have no awareness that it means somebody's coming from somewhere. Everybody, everybody's accounted for. So uh, listen, that is, that sometimes that's a gift and a curse, right? I tell people all the time, when you don't go to big time college, I went to a D1AA. 
So I was forced to do everything. So I had to go down to the DN room. Then I had to go to the linebacker room. Then I had to go to the safety room. But it gives you a skill set, which makes you unique. So listen, always embrace, embrace that. But, you know, when you talk about early in the season, and you see this happen around the league as, as a whole, is the tackling isn't as good because you really don't get the hit live and you're really not going with the same speed that, you, that you're going to do in the game. You know, how's your development as far as your eyes, your technique, and as far as taking guys down, developing, and how far do you guys think you have to go as a team to become one of the better tackling teams, be it that you don't get a lot of practice, that you're hitting dummies, and you're not really hitting live bodies like practice used to be when I played? Yeah, I think, um, you know, a lot of it is, um, you know, defensively, um, you know, treating, you know, even the 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 practice reps um, when we're, when we were, you know, just have helmets on or even when, you know, we put on shorter pads and, you know, full gear that, you know, we're in the right, our body position's right to, to tackle, um, you know, make, taking shots at the ball as well. Um, coach always says, you know, that that'll definitely make you a better tackle as well. Just putting yourself in a position to get the ball out or, or ball hunting um, and, and things like that. Just just putting ourselves um, in, in body positions that will, um, you know, help us when we're in those positions in the game. And, you know, now we're, we're wrapping up. Obviously, we're wrapping up on dummies. And, you know, even in practice, um, you know, how we would thud in, in training camp and things like that, that, that still, you know, carries over. Um, into the season, um, and, you know, it's hard to forget. Um, you know, you may forget, I guess, the the physicality it takes to tackle, but um, a part of that comes with, um, you know, just treating all those reps, um, you know, like you would bring somebody to the ground, but protecting your teammate at the same time. We're talking with Michael Carter, rookie defensive back here on Inside the Jets. And look, it's no secret that there is a lot of roster turnover for this team here in 2021, Michael. And there's a lot of youth. You know, I think it's something like 10 or 11 guys made their debuts last week in the season opener. There were six rookies in the starting lineup here. The fact that there are so many of you who maybe are lacking that NFL experience, but certainly not lacking in talent, does that help a little bit with the transition with all of you guys, maybe so many of you going through this journey together and maybe helping each other along the way as you go? Yeah, I think, um, you know, that's part of it because, um, you know, we definitely want to, um, you know, uplift each other and help, um, you know, each other succeed and as, as best as we can and also, you know, all the older guys who, who um, you know, help us adjust to the speed of the game and, and what what's being taught and, and how we can, you know, um, adjust to what's going on on the field. Um, and, and Coach always, you know, Coach would tell us, um, you know, a few times too, you know, you're never too young um, to lead. Um, and so, you know, in, in the corner room, Specifically, you know, speaking from from that perspective, that's kind of how we approach it. Um, you know, just being able to set the tone on the back end, um, uh, honestly, you know, helps helps everybody else in the long run too. Yeah, have you guys named yourselves yet? You, you guys have a name for yourselves. I'm not saying like a, like pop group. Like we, when I played, we were we were the Lions, right? And the DBs were the hyenas because they hunted in packs, right? They knew they yeah. were little. They knew they had to bring people down together. We had the Bears in front, which was our defensive lineman. Have you guys got to that point yet, or is it just kind of too early for you guys to figure out what your avatars are? Yeah, it might it might be it might be too early. We got some suggestions, um, but uh, I don't I don't think it's. Is anything set in stone just yet as far as, um, you know, uh, 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 animal or, or, you know, like some air traffic control, something like that. Um, you know, there's people throwing names out, but um, we haven't come to like a conclusion on that end yet. I'm really surprised that Bart's nickname was the hyena. You know, I, I, no, I no, we're lions. We're lions. You know oh, you were the we're, lions again. Yeah, I, we're I, the I kings. See, I understood where, where, wherever I played, the linebackers kind of ran the show, right? You understand? It was myself, Ray Lewis. You know what I mean? Peter Bower, T. Sizzle. When I came here, me, David Harris. So it was kind of like that, right? But the hyenas, man, they they catch you. We used to do stuff like in, in the hallways. The hyenas catch you. They might jump you. You can't kill all of them, right? You can't kill a bunch of hyenas. It's twenty of them. Like they hunt in packs. You know, yeah, lions are individual hunters. No, yeah, for sure. Um, you know, it's definitely a lot of us. Um, but, you know, we're definitely, I feel like we're close. Um, it, but as far as a name, uh, you know, I don't think it's anything official yet. But, uh, you know, we break it down on uh, the Dirty Boys or, or you know, 
Uh, what else? Air traffic yeah, control, continued. stuff like that. To be continued. It's working. Yeah, to be continued. I, I I get it. So tell me, tell me this then, right? You know, coming into this year, the concern was that they didn't have enough. You guys didn't have enough experience, or you know, maybe the talent there, and they were surprised. Let Bless on Austin go. You know, it was rumors that maybe you know because Sala was from San Francisco, that maybe Sherman would come. You know, but you guys have played at a high, high level. You know, no balls, no explosives. For the most part, you guys have been, you know, I think really the strength of this team as well. Like, what type of pride is is going into that? And, you know, how are you guys gelling as a unit as far as the hardest thing when you got a bunch of people that's never played together is the verbal and nonverbal communication. How is that development going? Um, I think, you know, we're getting better and better, um, you know, day by day and week by week. Um, communication is huge, um, especially on the field. Um and then, you know, it starts in the meeting room, how we communicate in the meeting room when we're watching the tape in practice. And then, you know, um, that's, that'll translate to the game when it's loud and you really can't hear that well. But, uh, you know, you might hear a little, you might hear just something, a sound from somewhere on the field and that'll get your attention and, and let you know, you know, what's supposed to be going on in that particular play or something like that. Um, so I think, you know, week by week, uh, we're still growing together. Um, you know, that's part of the process, um, you know, young guys, but, you know, everybody's hungry, um, humble and hungry for sure. Well, we want to get into more with Michael Carter coming up next year. And we were talking about names before. He also shares one with one of his teammates, which we'll get into coming up here in just a bit here with Michael Carter, the rookie DB out of Duke. This is Inside the Jets presented by EY, Building a Better Working World. And welcome back to Inside the Jets, presented by EY, Building a Better Working World. Dan Gross of Bart Scott, joined by Jets rookie corner, Michael Carter. All right, Michael, obviously a lot of Jet fans know there's two Michael Carters on the team, both part of this rookie class. You got the running back out of North Carolina, you the defensive back out of Duke. So not only did you go to colleges that were rivals, Duke and North Carolina, now you're on the same tier. How has that whole experience been like for you, coexisting with two guys who bear the same name? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's honestly been pretty, pretty easy. And, and um, you know, we kind of got along right off the rip. So it wasn't, uh, you know, anything, you know, crazy. Um, but, you know, we came in um, and you kinda, we kind of just meshed together. And, you know, um, now we're on the same team. So um, it's even more, you know, a stronger relationship. And, you know, we knew of each other uh, when, we was in, when we were in school. Uh, but now we're on that same team, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a good relationship we have with each other. Well, you know, how about, how about, well, no, I was going to say, Bart, like, think about, think about the possibilities you guys could have one plays offense, one plays defense. I mean, we got to get the marketing and the merchandising department on this. I mean, yeah, you know, right. MC one MC two. I mean, think we could do something like this, right? Yeah, for sure. Well, I'm, I'm definitely, what I'm trying to figure out. When y'all at practice, y'all both at the field. Somebody says, "Damn it, Michael!" Like, which one do y'all turn around? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, like, like it's like coaches are like parents, right? They got to make sure and understand that it's two Michaels out there. So, how do they differentiate the two when they're trying to coach both of you guys up and, and yell from the sideline during practice? During the game is easy, right? Because if it's defense, you're out there, you know who the hell getting yelled at. But if yeah. both of y'all at the practice, how y'all know who they, who getting chewed up? I think uh, I've kind of taken on the just the the part of the name so i'm like mc i'm just mc and he's like mike or michael and and so um it's not you really took the swag man you took the swag down there yeah. you're, gonna mike, you're gonna take mc yeah I mean, mc mc too whatever whatever the coaches want us want to say but uh so it's not really too much confusion as anymore on that on that end now i want i want to get into the game right because i've been part of every situation that ever can happen on the football field. And it's always tough, you know, to try and stay the course and keep everybody together when you have, you know, the offense struggling and, and having turnovers and you got to get back right back out there, change the possession. What was the morale like and what was the mindset, you know, when you have the turnovers, you got to go right back out there after, you know, going out there and playing well. And did you guys wear down a little bit, you know, because maybe, you know, taking the extra reps and extra snaps? No, I think the the only thing on our mind was uh, you know get the ball back for him, um, you know just do what we control what we can control, because um, if we were in the in the position you know they do the same for us, um, and so that you know that's that's part of being a team um, uh, lifting each other up and keeping each other uplifted, um, and, and so 
you know, when things aren't going our way, we know they got our back. And when, and when you know, things might be going the other way, uh, we got them. That's just, you know, part of being a team. And that's kind of the mindset, you know, we had uh, in going forward throughout the whole game. Um, I think everybody did a great job. You know, winning and losing, right? That's the ultimate. That's what you're measured by the final score. But given everything that took place in that game yesterday, some of the things that Bart was just alluding to there, Michael, I mean, the defense as a whole, you only allowed 260 yards. You know, you kept this team in the football game. I know that Coach Sala likes to preach about, you know, limiting the explosive plays and not giving up too many of those. And for the most part, you guys did that yesterday. I mean, do you take any sort of satisfaction away from that yesterday saying, you know, as a whole, I think we did a pretty good job? I think, um, you know, just taking away from yesterday that, um, you know, as a unit, you know, we, the way we finished and, and fought, um, uh, we have a chance to, to be great and then we can continue to make the team great um, as a result of that. Um, and, uh, but, you know, obviously uh, there's no satisfaction and, um, you know, if we couldn't pull it out, um on on as far as that so um that yeah that's really how i feel but i think we finished good um but then you know we still we got to get the ball back for them as well so we got a lot of things we can improve on too but a lot of of promise i think optimism now you know it's weird right i like to flash forward a little bit now, thinking that you guys have Denver, right? That's that's one thing, right? Because when you go to Denver, you don't know this yet. They're going to have the altitude sitting there for you. You know, when you walk in there in the locker room, they're going to make sure that you know that it's thin air up there, right? But also, you for the first time, you I don't know if you've ever played, you know, at 4 o'clock. Uh, I'm sure you maybe played at 4 o'clock or a night game before. But, you know, how are you in developing your routines so you can learn how to deal with a one o'clock game opposed to a four o'clock game opposed to a Monday night game or Thursday night game? How are you developing your routines? Do you have any like crazy routines that you do to get get ready for a game, understanding that you have to eat at different times so that the in energy kicks in right? Um, yeah, I think I kind of keep my routine but probably kind of lame, to be honest. Um, uh, as far as on game day, you know, I try to wake up so I can, you know, eat breakfast at a decent time. So it's not sitting on me um, as far as for a one o'clock game. So it's not sitting, but, you know, I have enough energy to to get through it. I'm full enough to, you know, um, perform at, uh, you know, my highest level um, as far as how a four o'clock game would go or has been in the past. You know, I kind of just keep all that stuff similar to college. Um, you know, go, go eat breakfast, go back to the room. I might go back to sleep. I might not. And then just wake up, um, eat again and, and get ready to play. Um, you know, as far as on, on game day with me, um, I feel like, um, I'm super prepared. And so it's not as much as, um, as far as, you know, are you the quiet? Are you the quiet guy? You to yourself? Are you you because you got the dudes that want to be amped up, want to get everybody, want to talk to everybody. Then you got the guys that's in the corner with their eyes covered, laying out off their feet. Then you got the, then you got the other dudes that's sitting up there talking stuff or t dude that's watching TV. Which one are you? Yeah, I'm definitely I'm definitely a chill, um, you know, laid back. But but trust me, I'm definitely locked in and, and focused. And you know, I'm just as hype as the you know the hype men themselves. Um, uh, you know, I just we get on the field, it comes out. But as far as, you know, pregame and and things like that, you know, I like to just keep all – I just like to keep to myself and, and um, you know, just relax because I don't want to get too – I don't like to overwhelm myself um, with what I might be feeling or, or what I'm thinking about. Um, you know, just stay neutral. And then when, uh, when I get on the field and I see what's going on, you know, everything just comes to me. I know I prepare well, um, and, and that's kind of how – you know, it's been throughout college and, and I kind of take I've been taking the same approach, um, you know, so far in the league as well.
Yeah, Michael, real quick here before we let you go, and just I'm curious, you know, your transition to the NFL as a rookie, you know, we were talking a little while ago how, you know, you were kind of glad that you could put all the academic stuff away. You went to a school, Duke, which is a very, very prestigious academic institution there. What do you like to do in your downtime, your off days that you have here now during the season? What, what does Michael Carter like to do to unwind? Man, you know, I, on, the, on the off days and downtimes, um, you know, definitely take care of my body. Um, and, you know, make sure, you know, I'm getting back to 100% or as close to that as possible um, to, to, you know, take on the week and, and, and tackle every obstacle and, and all the adversity that may come with preparing for a week and practicing hard and things like that. And then, you know, playing video games has always been my thing, probably forever. Um, you know, I'm still just, you know, young and uh, I like to play, you know, Madden, MLB, Call of Duty, all that stuff. Just, just take me away from from football for a little bit and just everything outside of, you know, my my little room and that TV right there. Do you play with yourself in Madden? I have, yes. What is I that have, like Don't you? do it early on. They disrespectful early on in your career. Yeah, They're, I real seen that. I seen it. They're very disrespectful, but, uh, you know, I ain't going to lie and say I ain't up my stuff a little bit already, up my stats, my, my attributes – making plays on Madden as well. So, uh, you know, I've already been on that. No doubt about that. Well, that those numbers are going to keep going up as you continue to keep playing well and doing your thing. And, Michael, we really appreciate a couple of minutes from you today here and continued success. I'm sure things are only going to get better for yourself and that defense as we move forward through the season. But we always appreciate you carving out some time. Yes, sir. Appreciate you having me. All right, so that's Jets rookie DB Michael Carter joining us here. we got a lot more to do on Inside the Jets, presented by EY, Building a Better Working World. And welcome back to Inside the Jets, presented by EY, building a better working world. Dan Grasso alongside Bart Scott. And remember, Jets fans, you can watch Inside the Jets through the Jets app, presented by Fubo Sportsbook. Go to the App Store or Google Play right now and search official New York Jets. Bart, let's go around the league in the time that we have left over. Uh, I would say that the game last night between the Ravens and Chiefs, I think that one was pretty entertaining, no? Oh, that was the cherry on top. I mean, you talk about the 4 o'clock games were exciting, came down to the wire, whether you want to talk about Dallas and Chargers. You want to go back and talk about Minnesota, Arizona. I think, you know, the NFL in week two did not disappoint. We knew that it was going to be difficult for them to outdo week one, but I think they did. I mean, you talk about Dallas, your last-minute kicks. Some teams made them. Some teams didn't make them. But it all came down to that fourth and one that stole the show. Talking about Lamar Jackson and how that game started with him throwing a pick six, another interception, and they just stayed the course. And it gives you the glimpse of what you hope that, you know, you just take the guys out the uniforms and you put Zach Wilson in one uniform and you put you, you give Robert Sala over there and you you hope to have that type of relationship that John Harbaugh has with Lamar Jackson when he looks into his quarterback eyes and say, you want to go? You want to go? Are we going to go? And like, yeah, we want to go. Knowing what he was already going to say, you know what I mean? And, and that's what we're building to, right? We saw some great examples of quarterbacks kind of punching above their weight teams like you know defying the odds because you know early on in the season we think we know who's good who's going to be good and then week two just shatters everything you talk right. about the the, the 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 las vegas raiders going to pittsburgh after pittsburgh Crazy. was dominant against the buffalo bills and getting the job done you talk about nobody thought baltimore was going to win you talk about minnesota the agony of defeat missing a 37 yard field goal week two gave you everything that you wanted no, you're right about that. And let's start with that Chiefs-Ravens game last night. And that's a big one, potentially. I mean, you talk about playoff implications, tiebreakers, that sort of thing. You never know how things are going to stand in early January once we get to the postseason. But as you watch that game unfold, it had the feel of whatever team has the football last right. is going to win the game. The problem for Kansas City was you thought they were going to have it last. And then Edwards Alaire puts it on the ground. Baltimore recovers it. And Lamar Jackson, as you said, the fourth and one ices the game himself. Coach has trusted him there. I'll tell you, that is a heck of a win for the yeah. Baltimore Ravens coming from behind, especially Bart. Think about how crushing that week one loss was for them right. out in Vegas against the Raiders. That is a huge statement for them last night. On a short week, right? And right now yep. they're one and one because people thought, even myself, being a former Ravens, like, hey, well, they're probably going to be 0 and 2, but it's okay because everybody else has lost in the division. Cleveland has lost, Cincinnati has lost. But right now, now they're tied with the lead. And you talk about who has the best win in all of football, you have to say that the Ravens, well, not in, in that division, you have to say the Ravens. And what, it, what really it showed me and what I've always known, you know, being a former Raven is about their DNA, right? Because 
when you take the players away, the standard remains the same. And that's really what we're trying to develop here with the Jets, right? A DNA. What is a Jet? Play like a Jet. What does that mean? We've always known with certain franchises what that meant. And playing like a Raven, you know, what it is to mean a Raven. You know, you talk about you change the names and, and, and you change the names and the people change, but the standard remains the same. Are we, we, how, how often did we talk about all offseason about Owe not having any sacks at Penn State? Yep. Who made the big play? Owe, right? right? And, he was, and he was busy all day, right? Because he also caused the other interception when he came back and he mirrored you know, Mahomes and got him and was taking him down for the sack and Mahomes got the interception, right? So I think, you know, if anybody watched that game, you should be able to, one, be excited about – the league is in a good position when you think about that duel because that duel is going nowhere, right? Lamar Jackson versus Patty Mahomes is going nowhere. And that's good for football. It's saying that, hey, the position is in a good spot with the young, talented quarterbacks in this league as we usher out the Drew Breeses, as we usher out the Ben Roethlisberger, as we usher out the Phillip Rivers, mm-hmm. that the standard and, and the entertainment factor is tremendous. They both get it done, but they get it done in so many different ways or uniquely different ways that it's fun to watch. And you know something? I know that, look, the Chiefs are the Chiefs. They're going to be fine. You know that as long as you have Mahomes in that offense, they're going to put points yeah. up on the scoreboard. But the one thing that stands out to you, when you look at the, their performance the first two weeks of the season, their opponents are eight for eight in the red zone. So that defense has to buckle down here and start yeah. to make some stands because, you know what, even if you have Superman at quarterback, eventually it's all three phases in football, as we talk about a lot. That defense is going to have to start to make some big stops if they want to get to where they want to go. Yeah, what did the Ravens do, right? They said, we're going to keep Mahomes on the sideline. They have a seven-minute drive that wears the defense out. And it was a battle of attrition, right? And, and they were able to just outlast him. Now, listen, Mahomes was probably going to go down if a layer doesn't fumble and win that game. But then you could say, hey, well, what if you don't have those turnovers in the first quarter? It's a much be- different ball game. And eventually, that's what that's what Tampa did. That's what they showed. Make the defense have to you know hold up their end of the bargain. So often, you think about Mahomes putting up so many points and explosive plays with Tyreek Hill – that you're two scores behind and you can't catch up. You know, the Ravens kept it in striking distance. They made big plays. And it was a great game to watch. You know, you talk about, you know, early on MVPs. You got Lamar Jackson. That's, you know, definitely always the MVP candidate. We know Mahomes is. But I tell you what, man, we got some people that's invited to the party. When you think about what the air raid and what Arizona has been able to do with Kyler Murray throwing for over 800 yards in his first two games. And Derek Carr, you have to give yep. him his credit. You know, I'm sorry, Derek Carr is throwing for over 800 yards. And this offense has never been a problem. Looks like they have a little bit better defense. So, it's, listen, it's so much exciting going on. But the one for me was, like, I like the throwbacks, right? And the Ravens win, and that was a throwback, right? They run the ball. They play good defense. But, man, did you see King Henry and what he was able to do, putting the team on his back, Julio Jones, after he was punching at the air like Trey from Boys in the Hood, comes back and gives you six for 120. Derrick Henry puts the team on his back 187 yards. And then, listen, just going down – and, and, and winning the way that you play. The Ravens and the, and, the, and the Titans play the game like they're in 1990, right? Running the ball. And listen, what's old is new and what's new is old. And it's interesting to see how this season's going to play out. But we're off to a great start. Jets play the uh, Titans in a couple of weeks at MetLife Stadium. That'll be the next home game on October the 3rd. You're so right about Tennessee, though, right? Because they were down a couple of scores in that football game. And so many times we see teams around the league when they trail like that, it's, oh, we got to abandon the running game. We got to throw, 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 throw. Not them. They stick to their DNA. They stick to what their bread and butter is. And you said, when you got Derrick Henry, I don't know how many more years it's going to last, given the workload that he produces. But you know what? When he's still ticking, you might as well keep running him, Barton. It works for him. And so, you know, it's a supernova, right? Because to me, the the biggest comp we have isn't Eddie George. It's Brandon, it's Brandon Jacobs, right? They're built the same, but the, his ability to continue to play at a high level and get stronger. You know, Brandon Jacobs was only, was only good for like 14 carries, and that's what he would get a game. King Henry puts the, the team on his back, and he's been doing this for North for three years. Like you said, it's like a supernova. You don't know how long it's going to last, but, man, is it beautiful to watch. All right, let's talk about the Jets' next opponent here. That'll be in Denver, back on the road week three. Yeah. Now, look, the Broncos are 2-0. Teddy, and Teddy two, gloves. two Gloves. right? He's making it happen here. Now, they beat the Giants. They beat the Jacksonville Jaguars. This is their home opener because they have the two road wins. It's always tough to go to Denver. You know that. The altitude, that place is going to be crazy. They're welcoming in an undefeated team. But I wouldn't sit here and say it's an unwinnable game for the New York Jets. I think that if they play like they're capable of, they should be able to have some success in Denver. 
Well, it's going to have to be a complete team game because you look at Denver, they're stacked on offense and defense. They're, they have depth at every position. You think about Von Miller, you think about Chubb, you think about, you know, Sertain, Kyle Fuller, and, and Darby, and, and probably the best safety in the game. And Simmons, you're going to have to make sure you take care of the football, and punting isn't a bad thing. You actually can gain yards with punting. We understand how, how thin the air is. I wonder, hey, man, we who knows who's going to be out there, but – you know, Zach Wilson out there, he should, with his arm strength, he should be able to throw the ball 90 yards. So maybe burp the baby a little bit if you can get it and run a one man around and see how far you can get it, man. Things far, travel farther in Denver. But it's going to be interesting. They're going to have to play a complete game. Denver's a very, very well disciplined team. Big Banjo, I know him very well. He's a he's an old school player. You know, they have tremendous two, two good running backs. When you think about Gordon, you think about yep. Williams, but Fant and, you know, Judy being injured helps out a little bit, but Hamler has picked up the slack, and Sutton is a beast. Devontae Williams, like you said, the rookie from North Carolina, shared the backfield with Michael Carter from the Jets at UNC, both getting 1,000 yards last year. Yeah. Bart, this was fun as always, my friend. And again, we'll reconvene again next Monday and talk about a Jets trip to Denver, which we hope produces a W. But great job out of you as always. Likewise, man. See you next week. All right. He's Bart Scott. I'm Dan Grassa. This is Inside the Jets presented by EY, building a better working world. So long, everybody. We'll talk to you next week.